back to 2012, 2013, we were probably the only company that had all of these machine learning and AI tools together with a very mature self-driving car project. So we were able to put all those pieces together and that has resulted in the progress that we were able to show you on the video today. So four million miles, I did a little bit of math before we came out here, correct me if I'm wrong. Average of 12,000 miles a year for an average person. That's 333 years of driving for an average person. Does that sound about right? That would be a pretty experienced driver. That's Absolutely. Probably. And of course, the beauty of this is that all that experience is shared from one car to another. So these cars are really experienced. But how do you get people to understand and to appreciate the level of experience within these cars? I think, you know, it's, it's incumbent on us to do a really good job of training and providing experiences so that people have an opportunity to, to see what it's like. Um, the first part is, letting people see videos like this and giving them the sense of what it's like to be in a driverless car. Um, we've also found the in-car experience is, is very, very important. So you might have noticed the screen, uh, which you have the chance to experience at Council, which, which gives some indication of the, the incredible 360 degrees of vision that we have in both radar and, and LiDAR, but also our, our cameras. Um, we also provide a provision for the user to stop the ride if they want, so they have the opportunity to say, you know, I'm ready to pull over now. So we have that level of control for them. If you guys have been the first to get 2015, you did a driverless ride, and now coming to Phoenix, driverless cars for consumers, right? That's right, Tim. Um, so back in 2015, uh, we were the first company to put a fully driverless car on public roads without a safety net of any kind. Um, and what we showed the world here in, in 2017, just a few weeks ago, um, is a fleet of our Waymo cars driving around the, uh, the streets of Phoenix without any humans in the front row. And it, it's been somewhat amusing um, to watch some of the journalist community come up with terms to describe this because we have used driverless, I think, a little bit carelessly um, in the space. My favorite term, by the way, that I heard to describe this was driverless driverless, um, which I think is fairly unambiguous. Um, but the real magic sauce comes, I think, with the integration of that software with our own homegrown hardware. Um, so we've developed our own uh, vision systems, we've developed our own radar, we now developed three uh, different, a short range, a medium range, and a long range LiDAR system. They're all homegrown, um, and we've continued to progress um, the quality, um, the accuracy, and the cost of, of all of those systems. What about aesthetics? Is it a bigger challenge to get the cost down, or is it going to be a bigger challenge to actually hide that into a normal, normal looking car? So here's the thing. I, I wish we could ask for audience participation on this one. Um, imagine you're five years out from now, and you have the choice between two different cars. Mm -hmm. They're otherwise identical. Um, one of them has a dome on top that is an all-seeing, all-knowing dome filled with sensors. And wouldn't that say to you that I'm a car that has extrasensory perception. I'm a car that can do pretty magical things. So you think this could actually be a positive, seen as something that would be that would set this car apart as a safer car, a better car, by having this extra dome of sensors versus something that's going to go, uh, it's like we have a lot of You know, we're not sure how that's going to turn out, actually, but if you do look at um, just how humans are buying cars today, one of the reasons that people are buying crossovers instead of sedans is because you sit higher and you have a better view of the world. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, our sensors really want to be as high as possible on the car so that they can see more. So it's really just a safer way to make a self-driving car. You know, weather is definitely a challenge, and it's one of the reasons why we're not launching in Michigan um, as opposed to launching in a place like Phoenix. So yeah. there's no question that we need more work um, in snowy and, and frozen environments, for sure. Um, but right now, I don't think there's anything we see on our radar screen, pardon the pun, um, <laughs> that, that we don't have a plan to attack on our own. That's great. And, you know, I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand is just how many miles you guys are covering on any given day, not only in terms of the real world, but also the virtualization techniques. And how much of that has advanced since the launch of Waymo? I'm guessing that's been a big part of development as well, evolving your virtualization systems. Oh, um, so you're talking about the, our, our virtual world and yeah. simulation. Um, we just keep getting better and better at that. And again, going back to um, one of the advantages that we have at Waymo is being a part of Alphabet. So we have access to all of that server infrastructure, um, a lot of the really bright lines in places like Google Brain. Um, we're able to tap those and use them to deploy um, to advance our work here. That's certainly an advantage, a unique advantage, being a part of Alphabet is having uh, a lot of great